All right, we're at the three minute mark here. So I think we can go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome everyone to the August 28th CubeVert SIG storage meeting. Um, I have the agenda shared on the meeting now. If you have any other topics you'd like to discuss, please feel free to add those. Um, I am, however, really excited to get into this first topic. So thank you for adding it, Michael. Uh, why don't you go ahead and get us started, if you would? Uh, yeah, so uh, the problem is I was hoping I invited David and Bobby in to join. Okay. And uh, David said he, I don't know, he may, he may not be able to join maybe at 830 um or you know a half hour from now okay um so i don't know if, if there's any other stuff we can talk about before or um yeah i think it, i think it would be good to have him here if possible since he's been a major commenter on the proposal um so why don't we go down to the cdi issues for a bit here and see if we can take care of some of that stuff first. Uh, and also if anyone else has a topic, uh, you can add that and we'll jump back and catch that at the top here. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and open this issue that we left off at. Okay, so we have the wait for first consumer Seth Lane is slower than when using immediate binding. So I'm through this one. Oh, yeah. no. well, I was going to say I have some deja vu about uh, about doing this. And I think, as I recall, the conversation kind of wrapped around the need to investigate where the time is being spent. But we currently really don't have any instrumentation in the CI yet to really understand that. Um, and I think maybe there was a a casual uh, agreement to investigate further. And I'm not sure if that's happened. Yeah, I definitely didn't invest more time in it. Um, yeah, there is, I don't remember if I brought this up, but this goes back to uh, older branches. So pre-populators, this is the same. I have this uh, PR opened on the 156 branch. And I could see the same thing. Like the wait for first consumer lane is taking a whole lot longer. Okay. So it's not something new. Of, yeah. Any ideas about the bottleneck where it could be? I wonder if, like, just as a really simple thing, does Ginkgo allow you to add uh, timestamp uh, logging to each of the, like, the buy statements in the tests? Or like so that each time it's printing out the uh, detailed steps of the test that it could actually write a timestamp. And I don't know if we could somehow just turn that on, then we'd actually be able to see, um, you know, that, oh, it seems like there was a lot of time between a couple of steps. And then maybe we could look further into that and why that's taking so long. Yeah, uh, I'm not familiar with, uh, with the tunables for ginkgo but yeah it seems like something that should be there i'm gonna write that as a as a suggestion in here and then i don't know if anyone else has any thoughts or ideas it seems that we just need to enable ourselves to understand what's happening and if we don't have a ginkgo um argument to enable this, we have, uh, it can always do it like bash through bash somehow. I've seen, I think I've, I've seen that in the Kubert repo, they have like time stamping of everything enabled. Mm -hmm. So that should be possible. We should probably also enable uh, or set the seed on the test so they don't get randomized. 
um, so we can actually compare, um, you know, the wait for first consumer lane versus the non wait for first consumer lane, where it's doing the exact same thing in the exact same order. Oh, good idea. Okay. I assume that the seed can be set by simply just like running a PR that changes no code, but changes that seed within the test framework uh, or something like that. Yes. And it should be a, a flag you can set to whatever you want. Okay. Uh, is anyone interested in taking, uh, taking on a couple of next steps with this? Uh, do we know... But okay, thanks. Uh, do we know like the degree of slowness? Yeah, I have some uh, timings above. Um, okay. So we do expect some uh, to to be for the wave of first consumer lane to run a little longer because every consumer pod takes around like four seconds. Mm -hmm. you know, spin up, delete, and stuff. Yeah. So we expect some slowness, but that should be like. 30 minute difference, but I was seeing an hour, hour and a half. So mm -hmm. that's pretty consistent through our CI. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, okay. So I think we've kind of identified the potential next steps on this one. So let's pop back up and okay. This was 2828. And that only find it. So anyways. I'm pretty sure we need to continue with 2848 uh, because we already did uh, the next one. Okay. And there's then... also, yeah, I see the smart clone stock data volume failing in GCP and did we do that one? Yeah. Yeah. We did. Okay. And then the copy the instance type and preference labels. Uh, that one too. We did that one. Okay. All right. So let's do. Local image is stuck. Okay, after creating a volume with CentOS local image, the pod that uploads the image gets stuck running indefinitely and the VM keeps waiting. Okay. Let's see, read write once. Okay, and then the VM to use it. So I wonder if the PVC is bound. Let's see. Alexander was on this asking questions. Okay, rancher local path, wait for first consumer. And the VM was set to run. Let's see. Hmm. Yeah, so it wasn't set to run. So oh yeah, rerun on failure means yeah, I get confused with the run strategy. So um okay. All right. Okay. Alexander, you did a lot of commenting here. So um, let's see, maybe you can give us the latest. Um, so the, the latest is, is he's using like a uh, local like uh, time or mini cube or something like that. And mm -hmm. when he's uploading, he didn't do a port forward. So that's why it wasn't uploading. Okay. So can we just confirm that this, we just need to ask him to confirm that the steps worked? Yeah. Okay. It hasn't commented in two weeks. So I'm assuming that he's, it's working for him. Well, I'm assuming. 
Okay. Do we want to just close it here or do we want to give him another opportunity to confirm? Uh, give him an opportunity to confirm. Okay. There's actually a very similar one open on Cooper Cooper right now. Okay. All right. Um, so let's go to API server fails to discover Kubernetes API. And let's see. Okay, so Alvaro has responded. Nice. Okay, so this one, I believe that was, yeah, last week that was commented on. So I guess we can give it a little more time for uh, the reporter to try out what you've requested, Alvaro. So probably nothing to do here. All right. And then the last one, high and critical CVEs. Do we know where this came from? Couldn't we bump the RPM dips? So I think it's really easy nowadays and uh, with the setup we have in CDI. This seems yeah. like an automate. Yeah, this seems like an automated report. Have we seen the these kind of reports before? Yes, we've seen people report and, and usually it's the Go version. Mm -hmm. was too old and if their scanner found something and we just updated the Go version. Mm -hmm. But this looks like it might be RPMs. So. so they're saying Go 118. We've been using 119 for the past half a year, I think. Right, but if we're like 119.2 or whatever and the latest is like 119.7 and there might be a bug fix in the 119 whatever. Mm -hmm. So are these, I wonder if these are for the main branch or for like, then for like older branches, maybe. If you say that since we're, if we're on a, a newer version, then. Oh yeah, it says it's 156, yep. so. Yeah. Right. Okay, so that kind of brings up a question, like how are we handling those kind of older branches? Like, I don't think we, I don't know that we have like a documented uh, policy about, you know, how how long or to what degree we'll uh, maintain security fixes or other updates on previous branches. Yeah, I don't think we, we have one of those. Mm -hmm. Usually we'll try to be very similar to Cooper. I believe they do N minus two, so. But that would include all like interim branches, not just like not just like stable branches that um that we're backporting to, I guess, right? So well we we have to backport it to you know 157, 156, and 155. Right, right. Okay. So what do we want? How do we want to handle this one? Should we like do you want me to assign it to you, Alexander? And you can take a look at maybe updating the the RPMs. Yes, I can, I can take a look at it. And we may not be able to do the Golang in the older versions. I guess we just need to make a decision about how intrusive that is. And at some point, I guess, just trying to think about that. Yeah, I think if we want the Go version uh, CV is fixed, then we have to backport stuff like uh, Builder Bump you know, the builder we use to uh, run all the make targets in CDI. Yeah. So I think that's intrusive. I'm not sure. 
Yeah, I guess the question is, well, how, we should maybe, maybe we should take a look at um, in cubevert cubevert if they have any kind of like statement on that or you know like what if, if they have a policy on that and see if we want to conform to that or at least mention like you can expect that a certain number of previous branches will be kept up to date with security fixes. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a look at that too. As far as okay. It. All right. Sounds good. Thanks. All right. So that's all the uh, issues at this point. I'm going to go back to the agenda. Yeah, I, added, uh, I, I wanted to jump back to this issue where we had some developments. Well, which one? Oh, if the uh, if yeah. time allows one. Yeah. So, okay. uh, yeah, so basically this is only reproducible on, uh, on like the OpenShift uh, Slack bot clusters. Mm. Uh, it's like ephemeral OpenShift clusters. I, I'm not sure what's, the, oh, it says GCP. So it's mm -hmm. GCP ephemeral cluster. Um, they're using a storage called uh, standard CSI uh, that maps to, I can't remember the name. Um, well, not something we test very heavily, but anyway, what happens is that uh, at first we thought their container images were like malformed. They had a bunch of directories that there was no need for. Mm. And after fixing that, they still see this issue. So that wasn't the problem. Mm -hmm. The problem seems to be copying from the scratch space. Uh, once we have the layers, like the container image layers, and we copy them from, we copy like the chunky file from the scratch space. We just hit uh, EOF. Which is okay. weird, like I th like it's it's an IO copy call that fails. Unexpected EOF, you could see that in this comment. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, like it's I think it's a bad sign about the storage. I don't think it, it, we could derive a CDI bug out of this. Like if if you're accessing the scratch space and it's mounted correctly. How could it, how could, yeah, basically the image should be there, but it's not, I guess that's what that end of file means. And it doesn't seem to resolve itself. So any like, uh, um, if there was a not, some issue with the backend storage, it's been persisting for a couple of weeks now. So. so the only thing that pops into my mind is this kind of reminds me a little bit of when we accessed, um, so we had bugs in the past where we had to put in the fsync call after an import because the import would say it was complete. And then when uh, you actually tried to run the disk, if this uh, VM was scheduled on a different node, if the IO didn't fully write out, then perhaps uh, you wouldn't be able to see it on, on the disk of the other node because it's still in the other nodes page cache. So one thing I wonder is if we added an fsync call after extracting the uh, the file to the scratch space, if that could help to resolve the problem. Interesting. I don't know how the underlying GCP storage works, but if they are doing, you know, if they are doing some kind of IO caching and then we're quickly trying to access a file that was written, uh, from a different context, you know, I'm sure they're doing some crazy complex things underneath in order to scale or whatever. So I do wonder. Is it from a different context though? I thought it's like the same process that is, that writes that out is reading it too. Yeah. Mm. Should be. Yeah. Like the same exact process. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know. Is the source class the same as the actual source class we're writing to? I think that 
information is missing on this uh, environment, but the default storage class, uh, yeah, it was the default was picked up as as the scratch, and the same one was used for the data volume, the target data volume. Yeah, I doubt they would change that, but um, but I've asked for it. Uh, some some other person jumped into this issue. They're seeing the same thing. They're probably using the same underlying uh, storage. Or... Yeah, Dust Dusty's from the um the Core OS team, and I've been working with him actually on an issue related to LVM activation bugs. So that might be why he's been testing uh, our stuff a little bit more. Um, okay, but uh. Yeah, so I think I saw in one comment near the end, does this work with the if they do node um, first? Yeah. It works with node? Yeah, it works with node, but the problem with node is that uh, they need to supply some credentials. Ah. And I, I linked them to the cryo uh, docs, but you know, it's a bit messy to start giving uh, the node mm -hmm. the cryo config. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this mirror redirection is interesting, but also when if uh, I'm trying to understand, there's a performance disparity between um, the uh, pod pull method and the node pull method. Was that what we're finding? Well, is this is something. I, yeah, I was trying to avoid these these bunch of comments because this is like a different issue potentially. Okay. Somebody, uh, Dominic, uh, just jumped in and said that. We have uh, possibly a performance degradation. I don't think it's the case, but it's uh, okay. it seems not not related to the issue. Okay, all right. I, I wanted to check on that because, like, what that would sort of almost make me more suspicious of the caching issue because if like one method is super fast, is it fast because uh, the IO is pending still, and if the IO is the bottleneck or something? So, I mean, I do think it would be worth like. But I mean, it'd be kind of difficult to tap. Well, we would just have to provide a uh, like a version that does that. But it could be a little difficult to get um, um, to get it picked up in this type of environment where it's where it's adding an F sync there. I um, mean, that's just like a stab in the dark, honestly. Um, just so I understand the flow, because I think I forget in, in, on the registry imports uh for this case i think so we download like the tar layers and extract them in scratch uh and there should be a like a qcod2 file in there and then do we use mbd kit to serve that like and then do qm image convert from mbd kit Like I guess I'm I'm not sure is, is MBD kit involved in this flow? That's what I'm wondering. I, I don't think so. Okay. Because we have it on the file system. You know, once we've extracted the layer into the scratch space, it's on the file system, and we don't need MBD kit to do the cumulative image conversion. Yeah, we don't need it, but I think we still use it sometimes. I think, or or we did. Um. Mm -hmm. Well, they're using uh, CDI fifty seven. So they shouldn't be using a NBD kit for this operation. Oh, 57, okay. Well. Mm. Isn't the, the recent changes that Alexander did are in like a, maybe a newer version of 57, but anyway, it doesn't it shouldn't matter too much. I'm, I'm fairly certain we've never used MBD kit in the uh, registry import flow. Actually, no, I'm positive we haven't because uh, we only start MBD kit server in the uh, HTTP import flow. Um, okay, so it is it, but so then I'm curious about this. IO copy that is supposedly what is failing out. So, so if it's a kit, so I guess it's an ISO inside it, the the um. So in this case, image, not a QCOW. 
No, in this case, it's a Q power thing. I can double check this. Then, then I'm wondering why QMU image convert is not being called in, in, instead of io.com. Again, I'm just trying to figure out the flow in my head to think of where EOF could be coming from. If it's IO copy and we're copying from scratch, I think we would only do that if it was a, you know, ISO or a raw file. Mm. The only place I can think an IO copy would happen is when we're copying it from the layer into the scratch base. And then we call QEM is convert when we're copying from scratch. Right. Base. So, yeah. right. So the way that that works is, I guess, we open an HTTP client to download the tar file. And we just write, uh, we peek into the tar file and write the image to scratch. Yes, we, we use the, the lib container uh, library to do that. Okay, so this is actually writing to scratch and not writing to the target then. I, I would say yes, that if, if it's an IO copy error that we're seeing, I would say it's it's uh, the part where we're writing to the scratch, not when we're writing to the target. That makes sense. Yeah, I was trying to understand uh, util.go unable to write file from data reader, unexpected EOF. Okay, yeah. So, uh, well, so then that EOF could then be, um, that's probably that EOF is coming from the server side. So it's reading from an HTTP stream and it's writing to uh, Scratch Space. And it got an EOF while reading from the network, is my guess. Is it is it possible that the uh, image file is split across multiple layers? Is that even a thing? Like, let's say they decide the... the... No, I don't think that's how containers can work. Well, I think, like, there may be multiple copies of the same file, but I don't think the file is split across layers. Okay, I was just kind of wondering if maybe, uh, yeah, in that case, it should have been maybe like come out as zeros or something. But um, we are using a low level interface there. So if there was a, if there, and it, I guess it's weird that this is only because we can use, we can import this exact same image on a different environment and have it work fine. Right. Yeah, so, but I guess my thinking is this, is that this seems to be like, yeah, like a network connectivity to the registry host issue and not necessarily like a disk issue. Mm -hmm. So, and, and another thing that's interesting to me, I'm wondering, um, yeah, I don't know, because Alex said that this is like a connection that requires credentials and whatnot. Um, mm -hmm. I wonder if there's like some proxy in the middle that could be screwing things up um, or somehow it, it's just... Um, yeah, so... Um... They open the issue without mentioning the credentials, but they do have some flows that require credentials. That's why uh, pool method node isn't working for them across the board. But this is reproducible with uh, without accessing a credential protected registry. Mm. Okay, um, so we have some notes here um, and thoughts on it. I'm trying to understand how we can take a, take a single step towards the solution, what that would be. Uh, Michael's theory sounds right. Um... But what, what could we do if this is like an intermittent uh, network error? Could we keep retrying on that EOF or would that be too nasty? Well, shouldn't it try, shouldn't this failure cause uh, the data volume to retry? Is it like, is the- is Yeah, the shouldn't the pod, yeah, shouldn't the pod exit or 
container yeah. it, will, it will retry and it just keeps it'll probably just do that forever yeah and i guess it doesn't converge for them yeah uh, i guess i guess what i'm wondering you know i i assume that I, I don't know much about this code but it seems that um you know we're using some library to make this http request and download the file mm -hmm. um yeah so i would say you haven't tried scopio because we're using the same library scopio is and have a do a, a Scopio pool, and you should be able to provide the credentials with that and uh, see if that fails. Why is there credentials to the uh, to the CentOS repo anyway? If that's where it's coming from, cloud.centos.org. So the original uh, issue is using the QAIO con container disks, I think. And some other flow they have requires the credentials, like some custom built stuff. It's not something that's mentioned here in the issue. Okay, so CentOS is working then? Oh, I see. It's the, uh, oh yeah, we asked if they're able to reproduce with the same. Yeah, and they were yeah. able to, so. But I wonder if it works with container disks in a different registry. That would also be interesting just to check. Like that same container pushed to a different registry, like Docker Hub or something, if you're still allowed to use that. Um, Yeah, I mean, definitely to me, I think um, testing the same image authenticated and unauthenticated would be interesting, maybe. So a different registry is what you were agreeing with, or? Specifically, yeah, one that, that um, does not require authentication. Um, but that, that would be interesting too. I mean, maybe if it's another registry um, with authorization. But yeah, I think something is up um, reading from that HTTP connection. Okay, any other suggestions we want to make? I see that David is joined, so uh, I'd love to engage in the other topic. Thanks for joining today. Um, yeah, I'm going to add this as a comment, and then we'll jump back um, to the pr principal topic for today. So, um, yeah, let's go ahead with that one. Go ahead, Michael. Uh, yeah, so basically, um, there's been a lot of back and forth uh, on the data volume template design proposal. Um, I think some of the discussion has led me to think we may want to, um, I don't know, take a step back and think about some more funder, fundamental issues. Uh, and also, you know, maybe if we're on the same page, we can dig into some of these technical uh, discussions too. Mm -hmm. But this is just my interpretation of some of the, um, takeaways that I've had from the PR so far. Um, so the link to the PR is there. Um, I could give a background, but I think most of the people in this call know what data volumes are, know what populators are. Um, yeah. So, right. I think, and then David, uh, feel free to jump in whenever. Uh, I think, but, so I'll start off by saying, I think one of the main issues is that, you know, by adding, so we have popular, we had data volumes for a long time. Um, people are familiar with them. Uh, now we have these volume populators. Uh, so we essentially have two ways of doing the same thing. And that generally, um, it's, you know, not a good, it, 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 best case, it can be confusing. Worst case, it's, you know, not a good thing. 
Um, so I think maybe as a community, as convert developers and users, we should think about um, the path, you know, the best path forward. Um, again, data volumes, they're familiar. Populators, they're new. They're like the community standard. We've been waiting many, many years for them. Uh, they're here. Uh, they're still relatively new, but I think they're going to become the familiar pattern for initializing um, persistent volume claims. Uh, so populators are new. And then, you know, in using data volumes all these years, we've, you know, there have been some some issues. Uh, let's just keep it, you know, just stay that for now. There have been some issues. So when populators came around, I think some of us said, okay, populators are here. They're the standard. Um, you know, it makes sense for all your Kubernetes applications to just use populators. Let's, you know, data volumes have their issues. Let's just, you know, deprecate them and move forward with populators. But I think what, um, you know, in going through this PR, maybe we um, need to have more of a discussion about, you know, the second bullet point here, like can, should we fix data volumes? Um, so, you know, I think the main issue that we have with data, well, the main issue that we have with data volumes in their current incarnation uh, is that um, they basically cause issues with backup and restore programs, specifically at restore time. Um, the issue is specifically that we don't allow you by default to create a data volume if there is a PVC with the same name. Um, so it's a very easy issue to solve. There are annotations that deal with it. If you use one of our plugins, our backup partners know this behavior, they've handled it. But, you know, um, this is something that, uh, you know, out of the box, data volumes as is, it, 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 it's, it's a problem. There's this one and then there's the DR one, right? Where the, the oh yeah, I guess it's, is that the same issue? I'm, I'm kind of confused if we have two here or just- So the, uh, the DR issue, um, at least with Metro DR and, and Alexander can maybe speak more to the regional DR case. Uh, the Metro DR case is, uh, the, the Metro DR case is kind of fixed with data volumes using populators internally. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I think that, um, you know, this the same issue I think is relevant to at least the, the async or regional DR as I understand it, because the way that works is that, um, you know, PVCs are snapshotted on the source system. You know, this, you know, vol sync is, is, is like the application that we use. It doesn't know anything about data volume. So it's just going to snapshot a PVC and send it to another site. Uh, but to make, you know, the failover work, you have to do some, you know, metadata munging. <laughs> you essentially encounter the same issue uh, as we have with restore where, you know, Volsync is going to restore this PVC and then you, you know, your GitOps or your um, pipeline or whatever is applying, going to eventually apply data volume manifest uh, and you're going to get an error. So you have to do this and maybe Alexander can speak more to it, but there's some, you know, a little wonkiness there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I worked around it by using the data volume templates and having uh, Kubevert essentially eat the error and it'd be like, oh, okay, I can create the, the data volume because the PVC already exists. And 
it doesn't generate an error at the GitOps level, but it, the error at the Cooper level is essentially ignored. So, yeah. So, um, but yeah, I mean, obviously, with standalone data, with data volume templates are definitely um, can be a nice layer of, of abstraction for getting rid of some things, and that's. <laughs> we can talk more about that in the next section, but basically there are some issues um, there, especially, you know, the majority of the issues are with like just using straight data volumes. Uh, and it's mostly around this, this specific behavior. Um, could it be fixed? Yeah. I mean, the, the, the question is, you know, could it be fixed in a way that, um, Makes sense, you know. Uh, to me, I think it most of the time you would want this failure to occur because if a PVC exists named Foo, and you create a data volume, it would be named Foo. Well, if a PVC named Foo exists and a data volume named Foo does not exist, someone else is probably using that PVC. Is my general intuition. Um, Data volume garbage collection throws a whole weird monkey wrench into this, and that complicates things too. Um, but I, I, it could we change the behavior in some way where this restore situation works? Yes, I think there will be trade offs, and then the mechanics about changing this behavior because it's a you know API that has been around for five years is going to be complicated. You know, not saying it's not something we should maybe do, do or not do. Um, it's just going to be a lot of work. Like, for example, you know, um, yeah, it, it, we don't have to dig too deep into that. But it, I think it would be um, a big investment to figure out a way to um, make data volumes work in this fixed data volumes for so this I wonder particular issue. I wonder if, you know, just to get into that a little bit is because I, I understand that we have um, a current set of behavior that we've been using for some period of time, and we don't want to upset anyone who's happy with that current behavior. However, if we had a, we already had introduced one annotation to get data volumes to behave well without populators, but in the DR flow, that could be optionally added. So if we had a particular annotation that says we want to sort of uh, enable, um, I don't, we still have to name it and I'm not going to waste my time naming it, but we want to enable this new set of behaviors, right? Um, whatever that is. Um, and it could be experimental at first um, and subject to change. So if you opt into that behavior, um, you're opting into an experiment to work better with backup and restore and with uh, with DR, uh, potentially at the risk of compatibility that you used to enjoy. So if we do that, then we could work uh, incrementally to develop this because one of the big challenges of making these changes is there are multiple backup and restore options. There are multiple disaster recovery options. And so what may seem to work really well for one scenario might turn out uh, to have a snag with another one. And so it may take us a while to get this right. So I'm wondering if we had an experimental annotation that behind which we could adopt different behavior. And then once you have something like this, uh, it would be opt in. But when you have opinionated kubevert deployments with something like the, uh, the HCO, uh, we could potentially introduce uh, an API that, um, that automatically annotates uh, data volumes with a particular annotation or that turns this behavior on on a global level so that people don't have to deal with the the bad UX of needing to remember some crazy annotation. So I'm just kind of wondering, like, this could be a mechanism to introduce incompatible behavior uh, in a way that can be opted into. So I think uh, I, I don't know, me personally, I I think the annotation on an individual case by case level, that's totally fine. And I think something we could do, no, no problemo. Mm -hmm. uh, what I think is a little more concerning, or I think something we'd have to think more about is this 
uh, automatically uh, having some sort of global setting that does it um, e even in uh, like a, you know, on OpenShift. Yeah, I mean, like, so we are, the CDI APIs are still in beta, which means that we shouldn't be making huge changes, um, but they're also not fully firmed up as well. So part of me also wonders if remaining in beta on the data volumes gives us a little bit of wiggle room to make some changes. Yeah, I mean, for sure. Yeah, I mean, it, definitely going from beta to V1 is a lot easier than V1 to V2. Mm -hmm. um, and our, quite frankly, our laziness has paid off quite a bit in this way. I feel like well, we I would say, even V1 already. <laughs> yeah, well, I would yeah. say that I, I knew this has been, I mean, me personally, we've been, uh, as a team, been struggling with these issues for a while trying to get it right. We've taken several different stabs at the problem, and it's difficult. And like I've and I've always thought like until we use populators and until we solve this uh, backup restore issue, um, we should not call ourselves V1. But I think that after we come up with what works here, we could. So that's why I wonder, like, while we're trying to figure this thing out, we could potentially hide it behind a, an annotation. But like, it'd be nice if people could easily consume that if they like it until we get it settled and then maybe in time for v1 the behavior could change to use that always and then you'd have to opt out of it if we decide to keep the old rules behind but at some point i'd like to shed it's a lot of cases to cover like did they have the annotation or not um so eventually it'd be nice to shed one of these like the we had an early idea that the pvc should be recreated if it's deleted um because that would seem like the declarative thing to do and maybe a valid use case if somebody wanted to re-import the data. But like these days, I'm not sure I'm aware of anyone who's really using that. There's probably is someone, but. Yeah, the, yeah, the, I, I could imagine that being used, but yeah, I don't, I don't know for sure. But so, yeah, I mean, this is something we could do for me personally, I am, you know, very hesitant to change something on a on a global level like that with, without a like you know um yeah without without a sort of specific uh versioning behind it like i i, I would you know i just but it, it, it it's certainly an option mm -hmm. um yeah, I, I just, you know, and it may be good enough for people that are backing up and restoring their data volumes to just add the sanitation. I don't know. One reason to have a global option would be is if we wanted to, for example, at, let's say we get we get the behavior the way we think that it should be uh, behind an annotation that's, you know, single data volume applied. Um, if we want to run a test in the community, with people and say, we are thinking about switching to data volume V1 and we would like to adopt the behavior behind this optional annotation permanently in V1. Uh, so we would encourage, you know, like we're asking everyone to, to please try this and let us know if they run into any issues. Like this would be a way to sort of do this like like once in a, you know, when occasionally projects have a planned incompatibility, like it does happen, we try to avoid it. But if at least if we do it in a careful way, give people a, a large enough window to, to test it and see, um, then, you know, we could have a clearer conscience of conscience about it. Um, so I wonder if that would be an option. And then having a global thing to turn on would make it much easier for people to evaluate the new behavior. It, I'm not against a global switch, but I don't. I am um, personally don't think we should flick that switch ourselves. But if, if yeah. some user wants to do it, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. But yeah, I, so I think it seems again. This isn't something we have to solve here, but it seems like this is something that 
uh, this is a discussion. You know, we could fix data volumes. Should we fit again? This is still what even what you're describing, Adam, is not a small effort. You know, right. well, I and, would point out. Sorry, I was just going to point out that um, that Shelley Kagan did try to to fix data volumes in the past. And she ran up against kind of some staunch opposition from the community about changing current behavior. So this is why we started to look at uh, ways to move forward with that preservation of behavior. So like that is one of the things that's that stopped it in the beginning. Right. That, so kind before, of in, <clears throat> sorry. In, was, was that before populators or after populators that the before. criticism? Okay. Yeah. So, right. So the implicit thing is, you know, even is sort of with the um, knowledge that populators are out there and, you know, whatever, they, they have their own um, issues or whatever. Um, that does it is does can and should we fix data volumes with the knowing that there are populators out there and this is the new standard and blah, blah, blah. So it's not just, is this a theoretically thing that, I, I, I'm just saying that's a consideration and I'm not yeah, saying we, sure. we could or should not uh, fix them. It's just a- um, So I need to jump to another meeting in a second if if I might just add some thoughts. Um, my chief concern when I was reading this uh, proposal wasn't so much that we were getting rid of data volumes or creating another data volume like API, it had a lot to do with maintaining the utility of data volumes in our VM API. So the ability to express the, the source and destination, the source being container disk or HTTP and the destination being the PVC, clearing that in line for the VM spec. So the whole thing, that was one um, issue. And the other issue was if we're gonna have a data volume like API, so volume claim template kind of, um, overlap with the functionality of data volumes. I'd like for us to figure out a way to completely like get rid of data volume templates. So what would be the transition path? Those are the kinds of things that I would like to, to explore if we go down the volume claim template path is what's the transition from data volume templates to volume claim templates? And can we achieve that long-term? Like what I don't want is some sort of fragmentation where we have data volume templates and volume claim templates. And then we have to explain this kind of nuanced, um, <laughs> this nuanced behavior between the two, two customers mm -hmm. where, you know, use data volume templates if you need to do this, use volume claim templates if you need to do this, or only use volume claim templates and ignore that the data volume templates things exist. Mm -hmm. But yeah, this is that I think what you're talking about is basically my next point here with sure. what is the value of volume claim templates? And um, yeah, I mentioned the all in one thing. And, you know, to you, that is like one of the um, the major points of data volumes is you can create this VM and you get everything all in one. Yeah, it's one of the main points, but. Also, I just want feature parity with what we have because I want to eventually transition to the new thing um, and mm -hmm. get rid of the old thing. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. So, yeah, we talked about that a bit. Um, and, yeah, I mean, as, as, yeah. <laughs> as, as I mentioned, there are ways we can add the, like, CDI built-in sources. It, just get, it gets the API does get a little clunky at that point. Um, to me. Uh, but... My other concern when I looked at volume claim templates is uh, the proposal mentions a few things like wanting to preserve some behavior data volumes, like the storage profiles and things like that. Maybe that's mm -hmm. optional. I don't know. But it kind of, um, it makes what looks like a pure Kubernetes API have a little bit of magic behind the scenes. It still depends on CDI. Uh, yeah. So that kind of looks, um, it's like, it looks like we're pure Kubernetes, but then we require modules to get pure, like the behavior that people would expect. Um, yeah. I don't know. 
Yeah, I wonder... no, I, I, I definitely think that uh, is is valid, and that was really, honestly, the that whole <laughs> the magic part is was really, I think, the main motivation for adding them. And I uh, wonder, I wonder if we could switch where we keep the data volume template section uh, and its API, but we switch to under the covers actually creating uh, PVCs and populator CRs like and just don't don't actually create the uh the data volume object that would be yeah. weird so but that'd be fine i've thought about weird transition paths like that that yeah, might be okay i thought about that too and the problem is that even seems weirder at the api level than the magic of filling things in to me at least especially given the past um behavior like that that is something that would um I, I would consider I that a transient people up quite step. a bit. Huh? Like I would consider that a transient step. So we'd have uh, data volume templates and we'd have volume claim templates. And what would be happening is there'd be a not analogous. That's the right word. Um, it's early and I haven't had enough coffee uh, to each other. Basically, they would be the same thing behind the scenes. And eventually, when you drop data volume templates, it would like there's no functional change in behavior. It's just they're volume claim templates. Like and yeah, that would I mean, even give us a conversion webhook. So the conversion to data volume templates to volume claim templates, say if we did a VM version two, uh, it would be really easy to translate between the two if they're using the exact same functionality behind the scene. Yeah, you still have the issue of um, not being a pure Kubernetes thing. Uh, right. when you when you suggest volume claim templates, because we we do one of the key features we have to maintain is the the checking in with storage profiles because it's incredibly yeah. helpful. Oh yeah. So. Well, I've got to jump over. I'm sorry. It's a it's a meeting for hypershift, but yeah. Uh, yep. Good discussion. I, I think you guys get some of my points. Um, all of these are possibilities. Like I'm not shooting down. I'm not able to shoot. I'm not like trying to steer in one way or the other. I'm just asking some questions to make sure that we have a transition plan and are thinking mm -hmm. long term about what these API changes mean for us. Um, that's all. I don't yeah, want to get the I've... impression that I, I've I know I've reiterated this over and over. I'm I'm not like dead set on data volumes being for everything. We can get rid of them. We just have to have a correct or a, a good path to get rid of them. So, so I guess what I'm saying is, so what I'm wondering is like, uh, so you don't, without this full path laid out, you don't, can we proceed with volume plan templates or not? I'm hesitant to, because I think we might get ourselves in a situation where we have both of these APIs and they work subtly different from each other. And then it makes it, it's something we have to maintain forever. And then it gets like the, the API fragmentation is what I'm worried about, where we have to explain these differences to people. And then it just kind of, why do we have two APIs that do almost the exact same thing, but have these slightly variant? I, I, yeah. For me, I would want to see it thought through all the way. So there's only, and the long-term one API that we use on the VM. Yep. Okay. I, I think that's possible. I don't think that that's, it doesn't mean that it all has to be implemented at once like that. It just means that we have to have a plan that will very likely succeed long-term to getting us to that point. All right. Uh, thanks for joining, David. I appreciate we do appreciate your input on this. It's uh, it's really insightful and important. So thanks. Uh, I got to drop David. Bye. Sorry about that. Bye. And uh, for the rest of us, we are at the uh, slightly over time. So I'd like to end here. Um, thanks for the participation, and we'll continue this discussion for sure. So thanks everyone, and we'll catch you later. Bye bye. Bye bye.